Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them when they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases." Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our appointed Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11, we will say responsively by the whole verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying... He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. 
I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. A reading from Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. And then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The people answered him, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the people cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. Pilate said to the people, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. 
Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus It is finished.
Good Friday. We contemplate again the death of Jesus. And as Jesus died for us on Good Friday, we also contemplate afresh our lives. I want Jesus to walk with me. That's one of my favorite spirituals. But today, on Good Friday, Jesus walks not with us. For we must wait and watch as he on the cross leaves us behind to enter that place within us where we rarely desire or dare to go. And it is there that Jesus declares, it is finished. Jesus crucified, you see, my brothers and sisters, enters that chasm within us between the image of God, the imago Dei, in which we were created, the perfection in which God created us, and the imperfection of our shattered humanity. And Jesus, stretching out his arms, bridging that gap, declares, it is finished. The chasm has a name, sin. That word translated from the Greek hamartia, which literally means to miss the mark. Sin, therefore, I submit to you, is less about iniquity, our failing to fulfill an ethical standard, and more about our falling short of authenticity falling short of being true to ourselves, to others, and God, as God has so made us. And our awareness of sin provokes shame. You see, if guilt is remorse about what we do, having done those things we ought not to do, not doing those things we ought to do, then I submit to you that shame is sorrow about who we are. That we, by our very human nature, don't, can't get life right. And regarding authenticity, we just can't keep it real. At least not consistently What to do? Well, in my experience of myself and my experience of others, of my brothers and sisters in my human family, it seems to me that we humans deal with shame in two basic ways. One, we internalize it, punishing ourselves, listening to that long-playing psychological tape of our characterological flaws. I don't know if you have such a tape. I do. And when we don't externalize it, internalize it, rather, we externalize it, we project it onto others. Either way, we become head hunters, beating up on ourselves or lashing out at others, victimizing ourselves or victimizing them, lopping off our heads or theirs. Head hunting. In my observations of human nature and life in this world, it seems to me it is a universal act. Maybe it's a universal art with two 
unspoken, though universally understood rules. Rule number one, never discriminate. This is one case where we humans don't discriminate. Anyone can be our victim. Everyone is fair game. Nobody exists on the endangered species list. And then rule number two, when we become victims, and in this world we do, quickly victimize somebody else, preferably the one who victimized us. And if that doesn't work out for whatever reason, refer to rule number one. My brothers and sisters, as I contemplate life in this world and also scripture, headhunting, which is what I call it, began shortly after the dawn of creation. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, Cain killed his brother Abel and scripture says, Abel spilled blood on the ground, cried out for vengeance. And in that generation, seven lives of an enemy's family could be taken as reparation for a death. Seven. Continue to read on in that fourth chapter of Genesis. Only five generations later, Lamech, one of Cain's descendants, could swear, if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech, 77 times. It only took five generations to increase the number of reparation 11 times. Historically, the price of victimization and vengeance has skyrocketed, and we humans, horrified at the high and deadly cost of sin and shame, have devised strategies to civilize our retaliation. We call it justice. In the Old Testament, the elaborate system of temple sacrifice is an alternate example of how to remove sin and release shame. Still, it required bloodshed. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest poured out the blood of the sacrificial animal to wash away the people's sins. However, this ritualized sacrifice requiring annual repetition proved ineffectual, unable to destroy the seed of sin or uproot its bitter fruit, shame. And today, many, too many, far too many, still believe that bloodshed is the only way to right a wrong. A victim must be sacrificed in order to obtain justice for the offended party. Whether the offended party is a person, a family, a community, a nation, or a religion. What to do? God knew. Thank God, God knew the crucifixion of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus is the priest who offers the sacrifice. And on the cross, Jesus is the victim who is 
the sacrifice. So our hymn, Thou within the veil hast entered, robed in flesh, our great high priest, thou on earth both priest and victim in the Eucharistic feast. On the cross, even more, Jesus is the last victim. And so the Eucharistic prayer Jesus once offered is a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the cross, still more, Jesus stretches out his arms in the depths of ourselves, the depths of our souls, to touch the opposite sides of that chasm between the image of God and our shattered humanity. And in his death, he holds them, he holds us together. And there he declares, it is finished. Yes, his life. But not only that, the need for any more sacrifice. But not only that, our need to be headhunters. It's finished. Yes, as long as we dwell in this flesh, we will experience sin pulling us, keeping us on the side of our shattered humanity. Yet because of the crucifixion, we can cross the bridge, <laughs> who is Jesus, and reach the other side of the image of God, being true to ourselves, being true to others, being true to God as God has so made us. The unbreakable bond of sin. It's finished. The unbearable bitterness of shame. It's finished. Therefore, the only reason that we humans and this world Continue to seek victims and make victims is because we have not learned this primary lesson of the cross of Jesus. It is finished. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Andrew, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them for Donald, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, 
for the members and representatives of the United Nations, and for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you. They may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls. Have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of the resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection, for by virtue of your cross, joy has come into the world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. 
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, how by thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us. Save us and help us, we humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now and in the hour of our death, give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.